Dairy cows are not the only animals kept for milk. People in various parts of the world also milk goats, sheep, camels, yaks, buffaloes, and other animals. The men and women who harvest milk from these animals carefully tend their herds or flocks, sheltering them in pens or barns, moving them when necessary, and protecting them from predators. A lot of careful planning and hard work goes into maintaining a flock or herd for milking. But did you know that many ants do the same thing? I'm talking about tiny little ants, small insects around the size of a grain of rice that do the same thing people do. There are many ants that work hard at keeping flocks or herds of smaller insects to milk them on a regular basis. I'm not talking about ants accidentally coming across smaller bugs as they travel across a field. I mean ants that work hard at it, just as humans do, to keep their milk herd together, to safeguard the herd from danger, to move the herd to better feeding grounds as needed, and even to take the milk herd with them when they themselves relocate. If we look more closely at this behavior, we'll see how the wisdom that Almighty God, the Creator, gave to the ant glorifies God and brings him praise. He encourages us in the Bible at Proverbs 6, verse 6, go to the ant so that we can learn from its behavior. So let's do as God urges us to do and go to the ant. The amazing thing about the ant that God wants us to look at is that the ant's brain is unbelievably small. Scientists tell us that monkeys and chimpanzees cannot do things we humans do because monkeys and chimpanzees have smaller brains. So because their brains are so much smaller than ours, monkeys and chimpanzees cannot organize themselves to maintain and care for a herd of cows like dare, human dairy farmers can. But tiny little ants can do that, despite their minute, almost microscopic brain. The ant itself is tiny and its brain is even smaller, around the size of a period at the end of a sentence, or even smaller than that. While a human brain has around 86 billion, 86 billion, that is, neurons, an ant's brain has only around 200,000 or 250,000. It is infinitesimally smaller than our brain. Yet it enables the ant to mimic human behavior by maintaining herds of milk cows and by doing other things that we usually think only humans can do. And it glorifies God when we consider the wisdom he's given to these tiny creatures, the work of his hands. God inspired the writers of the Bible to make a number of references to ants and to other creatures God made to help us admire the Creator's handiwork and give him our praise. In the book of Job, God reminds Job of his creative power and wisdom by pointing out various animals. For example, God says, Look at behemoth which I made along with you and which feeds on grass like an ox. And then God goes on to describe that animal's strength that he gave it when designing it and creating it. Job is directed to look at the larger animals, but God also invites us to look at the ant. Proverbs 30, 25 says, The ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. It was God, of course, who gave the ant the wisdom to do that, to store up food in summer for the time in winter when food would be scarce and hard to come by. The encouragement we find to go to the ant at Proverbs 6, 6 is meant to teach us to learn from the industrious behavior of this little insect. The familiar wording in the King James translation says, go to the ant, thou sluggard, Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? 
Get a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. A modern translation puts the same passage this way. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summers, gathering food for the winter. But you, lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So the lesson is not to be lazy, but rather to work hard like the ant in order to reap the rewards of that hard work by having our needs provided for. And that's an important lesson that we all need to take to heart. But there's also another lesson in that same passage, and that involves the wisdom God gave to the ant to instinctively do those very things to ensure its survival in the dead of winter. Not only do they work hard, but they also store up food for the winter. That involves planning ahead. But who tells them to plan ahead? A whole colony of ants will work hard like that, planning ahead for winter, as the scripture says, but they don't have a boss or director directing their work. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter, the proverb says. Yes, an ant colony has a queen, just as a beehive has a queen bee, but the title queen can be misleading because the queen ant's role is really limited just to reproduction, not ruling or directing the other ants. Same thing with a queen bee. It would be more accurate to call her the mother bee or the mother ant, her role is reproduction. She doesn't give orders or direction to the other ants. They all know what to do only because their creator, almighty God, put that instinctive wisdom in them. The worker ants that scurry about doing their jobs don't have a governor or ruler telling them what to do. And that's amazing considering how they all seem to know just what to do and each individual ant fulfills his role in the overall activity of the colony. Although some ants build nests in trees, other ants build vast underground cities with as many as a quarter million inhabitants. This miniature, this miniature ant farm displayed in a store shows a small cutaway example revealing what's inside such an underground city that the ants build. The ant colony will include rooms or chambers for various purposes, with tunnels connecting the rooms and with other tunnels to provide ventilation or air conditioning. Each underground chamber is built for its own specialized purpose, some for storing food, some for gardening or growing food, some as dumps for trash, some as tombs for the burial of dead ants, some as incubation chambers to safeguard eggs, and some chambers in the colony as nurseries for raising young. Amazingly, as I mentioned, some of the underground chambers in an ant colony are actually devoted to farming or gardening, where they cultivate underground fields of fungus that does not require sunlight to grow. Yes, farming, with various ants doing different jobs on the farm. Leaf cutter ants go out into the surrounding fields or forests and cut pieces from the leaves of plants. Then they use their marvelous strength to carry those leaf fragments back to the colony's nest. God gave the ants the ability to lift and carry several times their own weight, as you can see from this ant carrying a leaf fragment along with a hitchhiker. The workers waste no time carrying the leaf fragments they cut to the gardening chamber's floor for other ants to work on them. And then the ants that cut the video, the cut the leaves, go back out to cut more, while the ants inside 
continuing to work on them. And it's not just a handful of workers cutting leaves and bringing them home. In the case of a large colony, it becomes a massive operation. Just as human cities are supplied with food by never-ending convoys of trucks on the highways, the leaf cutters form a multi-lane superhighway supplying the needs of the colony. But they don't eat those leaf fragments. The ants that cut them down don't eat them. Rather, other ants in the colony have the job of clipping the leaf fragments into smaller pieces. Then still other ants have the job of crushing the fragments, molding them into damp pellets and adding excrement as fertilizer. Then they set up an underground gardening chamber with a pile of fertilized pellets. And then still other ants have the job of plucking fungus from an existing patch of fungus that's overgrown and planting the fungus on the fertilized material in the new chamber. Then other ants, usually the smallest ones in the colony, tend the new garden, keeping it moist and weeding it by removing anything unwanted that may appear. Yes, Almighty God, the Creator, gave human-like wisdom to ants, putting within these tiny little creatures of His the knowledge and skills needed to prepare and plant gardens where they grow and harvest their own food. This should inspire us with awe and humble us before our Creator, who made us as well. But if the ant's gardening abilities are amazing, then how much more amazing is their ability to keep flocks or herds of smaller insects to milk them, in very much the same way that we humans keep herds of milk cows. Again, I'm not talking about ants scurrying aimlessly around and just stumbling across some smaller insects and obtaining food from them. No, I'm talking about an organized operation where ants intentionally and routinely maintain herds or flocks, caring for them and protecting them, moving them when necessary, and regularly milking them. <clears throat> Their herds are made up of aphids, small sap-sucking insects that come in a variety of colors and sizes. The aphids secrete a sweet liquid called honeydew as a result of their feeding on plants. The sugars in the honeydew are a high energy food, which many ant species collect and store to feed their colony. Ants that keep herds of aphids milk them by stroking them with their antennas. Then as the aphids secretes the honeydew, the ant drinks it in and carries it back to the ant colony to share with the stay at home workers there. We can see this ant here swallowing that drop of honeydew. Let's watch that video again and see how they milk their cows. So we see here that they've collected the uh, aphids together to milk them. It's milking time. The ant on the right there is just getting a drop of honeydew now. And now we need a close up to see what really happens though. Here's an ant on the right getting a drop of honeydew and then the one on the left is getting his own drop and starting to draw it into his mouth. Let's look at that in a close-up. He strokes the aphid and the aphid produces the droplet of honeydew and the ant drinks it in. The ants that you saw drinking in the honeydew don't digest it though as their own food. Rather they take it back to the colony and share it with others there and whatever surplus there is they store up in bottles. As you can see here, these bottles hanging from the ceiling in the uh, chamber where they store the food. Just as the scripture says, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. So the ants store up this precious liquid food for use during winter when food supplies are scarce. But those large storage bottles that you see hanging from the ceiling in this food storage chamber those bottles are actually ants too. They're ants that specialize in the job of filling their bellies until they swell up like that as living bottles to store the precious liquid for the colony. The ants that herd aphids to milk them 
also protect the aphids from predators, just as a human dairy farmer protects his cows. And when an ant colony migrates to a new area, or when the aphids need better plants to feed on, the ants will pick up the aphids, as you see here, and carry them with them to their new home. And some species of ants actually build shelters or underground rooms for the aphids and transport them every day, keeping the aphids safe inside at night and then taking them out and putting them on plants during the day to feed. All of these behaviors require cooperation, ants working together for a common purpose, as we can see here with this whole team of worker ants working on a single leaf. And such cooperative work also requires direction, although, as the scripture says, they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work. They all know what to do only because their creator, Almighty God, put that instinctive wisdom in them. Their complex human-like behavior, herding aphids to milk them, building underground cities, burying their dead, all these things testify to the glory of God, the creator of the ant. He says, I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. All the creatures God designed and made reflect his almighty power and wisdom. Genesis 1.25 tells us, God made the animals of the earth according to their kind and the livestock according to their kind, and everything that crawls on the ground according to its kind. He's the creator of every living thing. We learn about our creator when we closely examine the things that he's made. That's why God says, look at behemoth which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. He made us too, along with all the plants and animals. And he wants us to look at them, to look at the larger animals that are easy to observe, and also to look at the tiny insects like the ant. We honor God when we stand in awe, praising him for his wonderful creation. No wonder he tells us, go to the ant. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches.